In the mid-1980s, a Danish art house director burst onto the film festival circuit. His name was Lars von Trier. His breakthrough film, The Element of Crime, received several awards at various international film festivals, including the Technical Grand Prize at Cannes. Across the next 30 years, Lars von Trier gained a reputation for making provocative, challenging films that polarised critics. His films often dealt with mental health, abuse, mercy, sacrifice and existentialism. But over time, Lars von Trier himself became a figure that was as controversial and divisive as his films. The man with the reputation as a trickster, a mischief maker, one who likes to shock and push people's buttons. The man who famously made a bad taste joke at Cannes and got himself banned from the festival. And a man repeatedly accused of being a misogynist, one who's had accusations of abuse made towards him by one of his lead actresses. Interestingly, two of his most personal films, one from 2009 and another from 2018, are the Von Trier films that dabble most in the horror genre. Both films play out like visceral, gruesome and terrifying self-examinations. Both films appear to be Lars Von Trier taking a good look at himself and seeing the darkness within. I should have come here. Get out! Ah! Join me as we continue exploring the mind and body, and we discuss the house that Jack built and Antichrist. Chaos reigns. Welcome back to the Evolution of Horror. My name is Mike, and as ever, I am your host. If you're tuning in for the first time, then welcome. In this podcast, we explore and dissect the history and the evolution of the horror genre by looking at particular subgenres one series at a time. We are currently in our sixth series called The Mind and Body, and this is part 28. This episode is sponsored by $20 patron Dave Middleton, and this episode is focused on, as that intro suggested, all things Lars von Trier. We're going to be talking about the man, the filmmaker, and two films in particular in spoilerific detail, Antichrist from 2009 and The House That Jack Built from 2018. We've got lots to cover, so let's get straight into it. Joining me to discuss all things Lars, a regular guest here on The Evolution of Horror. He is a filmmaker, he is co-host of the Arrow Video podcast, he's a journalist, a writer, and he's a massive Lars head, a director of Frankenstein's Creature and A Little More Flesh... It's Sam Ashurst. Hello. Hello, Mike. How are you? I'm all right. I'm all right, all things considered. How how are you? How's life? Yeah, you know, uh, all things considered, like, I'm, I'm surviving. Let's, let's yeah. put it that way. <laughs> um, well, first of all, let me just start off before we get into Lars and everything else by saying congratulations on... Your next, your latest film, well, at least the latest one that I've seen of yours, which is A Little More Flesh, uh, which I finally had the chance to watch for the first time this week, and I absolutely loved it. So congrats again on another amazing piece of work. Thank you. Yeah. Um, Yeah, I'm so happy that you liked it. Um, Obviously, uh, it's a potentially divisive film, Mm. uh, much like the work of the director we're here to talk about. But um, (laughs) yeah, yeah, I've been surprised, actually, um, a lot of people have responded really kind of positively to it. I haven't had any kind of really negative reactions. Tell us a little bit about the film then for people that don't know anything about it and sort of where the where the idea of this film came from in your head. Um, Well, I'm going to keep this as brief as possible because sure. um, I, I want to save as much time for talking about Von Trier as, as we can. <laughs> um, yeah, sure. But, but basically the film was inspired by a combination of stories um, from the Me Too movement and stories that my uh, mum had told me about her time as a, a model and an actress in the 60s and 70s. Oh. Um, and there was like quite a bit of crossover um and and also the film star elf lions uh she produced it so she also made some significant contributions as well um i basically met with her very early on and um we 
kind of mapped it out together really but but that initial inspiration was uh definitely from my mum's stories and from what was going on in the news at the time that's fascinating i didn't know that that it was that that connected i suppose personally to you and your family as well like the the sort of inspiration of the story that's really cool um i thought it was you know what what's really interesting to me is that it did tackle some really really dark serious stuff obviously and and i can imagine there probably would be some people that might find it a bit um a bit shocking you know and but I think I kind of loved that it went for it and I also loved that it was just also entertaining at the same time as being thought-provoking you know it it genuinely made me laugh that's it and and that's kind of the intention um obviously I mean it is a comedy above everything else which might sound strange when we talk about the inspirations and, and stuff like that but um basically um I think there's a very fine line between comedy and horror and yeah. you can use one to make the other more intense. Mm-hmm. So what you're trying to do is create discomfort and potentially catharsis, depending on which way you take the story. Sure. Um, and I did actually want an element of catharsis at, at the end of the film. Um, so we were playing with the audience's kind of complicity um and how that would impact the ending and whether it would provide catharsis or potentially discomfort instead um for example at the world premiere um at starburst it was kind of amazing listening to the audience's reactions um and like the areas of the room where i felt like people were laughing with stanley Mm -hmm. they had a kind of a very different experience to the people who were laughing at him. Does that right. make sense? So the noises that I heard at the end, <laughs> I heard some like noises of glee um, from the people who were laughing at him. And I heard some <laughs> groans of discomfort from the people who were laughing with him. So <laughs> it, it, in a way, we've created a film as a weapon um, which I'm very happy about. That's amazing. Well, I loved the film. I, and I said this to you earlier, Sam, and you can quote me on this, that I, when it comes to films about artistic expression, films about um, art versus artist, films about filmmaking, I think A Little More Flesh is a better film than The House That Jack Built. So there you go. Now, I I, I massively, massively appreciate that compliment. Um, it, to me, that's a massive compliment because I love the house that Jack built. I know that you don't like it as much as I do, though. Um, yeah, that, oh yeah, that's a good point. No, I do. I don't mean it as damning with faint praise. I really don't. I mean, I genuinely think a lot of the film. So I, I would recommend everyone go out there and, and watch it. Um, Sam, it, can people? Is it readily available for people to check out? So, yep, absolutely. And this was actually one of the reactions I was kind of blown away by. So. Um, it's on Troma's streaming service, uh, Troma Now, um, which you can watch in the UK. Um, and the first month is free. And there's all sorts of other Troma movies on there. And, um, you know, Toxic Avenger and uh, Class of Newcomb High, all that kind of stuff. Um, and my film's in there too. And uh, as a result of it being on Troma Now, I actually recently had a meeting with Lloyd Kaufman nice Um, yeah he watched it because obviously he doesn't watch everything that goes onto the channel but um he told me that he kind of stumbled across it and uh, immediately his assistant got in touch with me to arrange a meeting and he said it was a work of fine art and um he wants to work with me on something in the future so uh (gasps) amazing yeah we'll see watch this space but um yeah very exciting how cool is that trauma? How does it feel to have your film in the in the the, the trauma pantheon, the trauma catalog? Um, I I feel really really proud. Um, mm-hmm. Obviously, like my stuff walks the line between art house and grind house, um, and I think that a lot of trauma stuff walks that line too. Yeah, um, and certainly in my meeting with Lloyd, like he was talking, like we were talking about. Um, the painters we love and the composers we love like throughout history like it was such a a lovely discussion but um yeah to be up there with these movies that i grew up on um yeah it was it's 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 an honor for sure amazing 
So let's get into it because we've got loads to cover and I know, Sam, you've got lots to say. So oh, we'll God. crack on. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, so this is very exciting. I mean, we've been talking for a long time about how we were going to discuss these two films and this particular filmmaker this week together on the podcast. Um, Lars von Trier. Now, I know a lot of people out there probably do know about Lars von Trier, but let's just, first of all, I just want to introduce him into this conversation because we've yeah. never really covered him or his films on the podcast so far. Um, Sam, let me start off with the basics. Who is Lars von Trier? So, the basics. Lars von Trier is a, a Danish filmmaker who, for me, is in the top five greatest living directors. Um, he is a true artist. His films all come from an intensely personal place. Uh, they really couldn't be made by anyone else, which can sometimes be overlooked by his detractors. And he has a lot of detractors uh, because he's <laughs> also a massive troll. Um, yes. <laughs> yeah, and I, I think that's something that we shouldn't forget while we're, we're going through all of this stuff. But even his name is a troll. I don't know if you... You know this, Mike. No. Um, his real name is Lars Trier, right? So right. no Von. Um, and he says, I started using Lars Von Trier at film school because it seemed like the most provocative thing I could do. Oh, no one really it. cared how my films looked or how well they did. But this Von business, on the other hand, really upset people. That's so um it, it's his his nature was there very early on um but in in a strange way it, that story kind of illustrates my point about him because von is an aristocratic name um and so it kind of distanced him like on a class basis from the other students in a way that really annoyed them um but it actually comes from a family story um his grandfather used to get letters with a von mistakenly added and the family would laugh about it um so it kind of comes from this pure personal place rooted in family that just so happens to piss people off um <laughs> which is a really kind of good summation of his work yeah i think that puts it perfectly doesn't it i i was thinking about you know like you say he's so divisive and his films tend to land in one of two camps it feels like you know there are people that will think his films or you know any one of his films are these kind of profound artistic expressions and then other people who just think he is like you said trolling people he yeah. is pushing your buttons for the sake of it he is trying to shock and provoke he's a mischief maker almost and i think both are true right i yes. feel like both are in in the in my opinion in the best of his films he does both those things at the same time do you know what i mean a hundred percent and i think it's part of the the cost of telling personal stories in the way that he does because what von trier does is he lets us see his shadow side right so he, yeah. he lets us see his his darkest elements um and i think that this instinct to push people away is part of that i i think there's a little bit of self-loathing with, with um lars von trier um mm -hmm. and i think you know i mean one one other little story from his past right yeah um he was an incredibly sensitive and anxious child um so he says I thought I was responsible for the whole world. I can remember, for instance, a flower that was growing by the side of the road and the flower had been damaged and couldn't stand up straight. But I managed to lift it up and support it. Every time I passed that flower, I had to check it was still standing because otherwise the world would collapse. Oh, now, wow. yeah, some people kind of describe him as a psychopath. Um, but I think that flower story kind of proves that he isn't. Like I think that he suffered trauma and has so much empathy that it, it does cause him to push people away um, with his words and his art. I, I just think he's a really, really complex human being. And if people kind of boil that down to just, oh, he's just a troll, like there's so much more to it than that absolutely i couldn't agree more and you know he, he i agree th there's an empathy there because yes his films can be grueling yes his films can be utterly devastating i think to the point of mm. feeling sometimes cruel i think towards mm. his lead particularly his lead actresses i think in some of his you know some of his most famous films like dancer in the dark and breaking the waves and 
you know melancholia and that kind of thing and it, it, but but i think like you say that is all that's all there intentionally that is all there to draw that empathy that devastation yes. those emotions out of us right and in, and and in that regard i think he's kind of the master at that a hundred percent like i couldn't put it better that is absolutely how i feel as well yeah yeah it's really interesting and you know and i said this to mary wilde i was like you know i i re- i love it you know there will never be a Lars film that i wouldn't rush to the cinema to see um he's one of those filmmakers for me where it's like it's like an event when there's a new Lars film out you know but some of his films I absolutely love some of them I really really don't like and I'm kind of angered by as well and I think you know and but Mary was like that's great that's all part of Lars isn't it that's all that's all the point of his films as well you know I think as long as they kind of I guess provoke some kind of reaction out of you I guess well, here's the thing, right? He not only is a uh, not only is he a provocateur, but because he's interested in that shadow side, he is. I mean, there's a good chance that someone is going to see one of his films and have a really troubling, disturbing button pushed. And yes. <clears throat> if that button is pushed within their own shadow side, their impulse is to be like, get the far away from me as possible do you know what i mean yeah Um, yeah so uh, i just think it is kind of part of his insight and it is part of the risk of seeing his films um yeah and uh, this is probably going to be something we'll go into maybe when we talk about the films but he he often has a reputation as well as being a misogynist filmmaker doesn't he yes Um, what and i know this is you know this is two dudes talking about this really but what personally do you think of that criticism towards him and his films Um, So I don't see Von Trier as a misogynist at all. Um, I I think he's written and directed some of the all-time great women in cinema. Um, Mm. And perhaps he feels that women are more cinematic because they're potentially a better vehicle for expressing emotion according to traditional gender roles. Um, But I just think he's very in touch with his kind of feminine side and I know many men who hate Von Trier, but I actually know more women who love his work. Yeah. And he has a lot of fans who are women. And I think perhaps he understands something about what women go through, um, says me, uh, a middle-aged man. Um, <laughs> I know, I know. We, we, can only, we can only kind of make our own personal observations, can't we? But I agree with you 100%. I, you know, so many of, again, in my opinion, so many of his best films are his ones centred on women, actually, yeah. and, and, and that emotional um, connection that you feel with them as well at the centre Yeah, and, and there's something else that people don't really kind of talk about, but um, not only is he kind of contributed to women's presence in cinema in front of the camera, he also has behind it, so... Several of the most successful Dogma 95 movies were directed by women. Um, you have Lonnie Scherfig's Italian for Beginners, uh-huh. Susan Beer's Open Hearts, and Natasha Arti's Old, New, Borrowed and Blue. Um, and yeah, there, there's others. But um, yeah, he, he's kind of done a lot for... Uh, or at least something. Let's not say a lot. He's done something um, <laughs> for, for driving women forward. Um in cinema. So you mentioned there, Sam, Dogma 95, actually, and I think it's probably a good idea to just quickly talk about that, isn't it? I mean, I don't I don't know necessarily how relevant it is to the films we're talking about this evening, mm. but just as context, um, tell us a little bit about that, about that manifesto, Dogma 95, which Lars himself, as well as a bunch of other filmmakers, obviously, kind of pioneered. Um, so it's a film movement, uh, which, as you say, was launched with other collaborators um it asked directors to follow a load of technical rules to enable their actors to blur the line between being and performing so it's all in the aid of naturalism and capturing a sense of reality uh as much as possible and it's stuff like uh, within the manifesto it was stuff like shooting on location not doing any adr um using handheld 
camera, that kind of thing. Basically, anything that would distract an audience from the reality of what they're seeing isn't allowed. So no crane shots, no action sequences. Um, it's it's a lot like documentary, but obviously they're dealing in fiction using those techniques. Exactly. It's a lovely way to tell a story, I think, isn't it? I, I, I love that, that kind of, like you say, it's almost documentary style. Uh, no artificial lighting, handheld camera. The dialogue almost feels improvised at times. Um, and everything there's a kind of immediacy to it i suppose yeah. and i find that personally just really exciting to watch you know in his films yeah me too and uh, actually it kind of with von trier he used those techniques a bit before um dogma 95 so breaking the waves obviously has a yes. lot of the kind of stuff um that they talk about um and there's that quite intense sense of realism in um breaking the waves so yeah i mean i love i love that he's kind of moved on um he only really made one movie that that kind of fits the the restrictions which is the idiots um but i love that he uses a bigger canvas now so you see him use cgi more and more but kind of with a painter's eye um but like you say he does still enjoy using handheld camera and stuff yeah um so uh then last question just generally about Lars I suppose is again for people that maybe haven't actually delved into Lars films and I know quite a few people that haven't that have still said they've never actually kind of dipped their toe yet into Lars von Trier's filmography as a fan Sam where would you recommend people start what's a good entry point or what's a good first film of Lars's to sort of to test the waters um I would personally say Dogville um yeah yeah b- because it's kind of got the the biggest star that he's worked with. Sorry to Kirsten Dunst, but you know Nicole <laughs> Kidman is obviously massive. Um, and despite the kind of Brechtian setup and some really disturbing moments, it's still probably his most accessible film. Yeah. Um, but in terms of my favourite, it's kind of a toss up between Dogville, Dancer in the Dark, and Breaking the Waves, and they're all kind of good entry points, really. But just for some reason, Dogville. Um, feels right yeah I was going to say Dogville or Dancer in the Dark as well Mm. actually and it is interesting isn't it for somebody that is so kind of out there and quite art house he has worked with quite a lot of big actors hasn't he I was I was looking again at the posters for uh, Nymphomaniac you know where he has all the cast members kind of pulling these sort of orgasm faces yes and there are so many you know you forget that there's like obviously Uma Thurman and then Christian Slater and Willem Dafoe and all of those pretty high profile names you know that, that do Clearly, he's a director that lots of people want to work with, isn't he, as well? Well, it's because he is an actor's director. Like, as much as he puts them through torment, what ends up on film is absolutely astonishing. Yeah. Um, You know, uh, he won, I think, the Palme d'Or for Dancer in the Dark and and Bjork won the Best Actor Award at Cannes that year. Um, And... Yeah, even like Breaking the Waves, like what an unbelievable performance that is oh, at the God. heart of that film. Just devastating and wonderful, yeah. So yeah, I I just think that pretty much any actor is going to say yes to Lars once, at least once, Some in some <laughs> cases twice, but yeah, Nicole Kidman certainly didn't come back. <laughs> yeah, it was a one and done for Nicole, yeah. yeah. So we're going to talk about two films that you know because he his films are all quite hard to classify really and they they're, mm. they're not they're not strictly genre films they're hard to put into a box but i think two films that for me kind of fit the this podcast and particularly this series of the podcast so we're going to talk about first of all antichrist from 2009 feel the seat underneath you feel yourself sinking down into it enfolding you It's a nice feeling. All you feel is a pleasant warmth and heaviness. Imagine you're at Eden. Imagine you arrive at Eden through the woods. What frightens you? So uh, a couple are going through the grief of losing their child and they decide to get away from it all in a cabin in the woods to confront their pain and be comforted by nature. Things do not go according to plan. 
there you go. And that synopsis itself sounds like a horror film, doesn't it? It uh, does. Cabin yeah. in the woods, yeah. gone. You know, trip gone, camping trip gone wrong, basically. Um, so, Sam, tell me a little bit about your own sort of personal sort of relationship and history with this film. When did you first discover it, and, and what do you think of the film generally? So um, I first watched it relatively recently, actually. Um, mm. Yeah, because even though I'm an obsessive uh, Lars von Trier fan, uh, something about Antichrist scared me off a bit. And I think it's partly because I was in Cannes the year it premiered and other journalists that that saw it um, because I couldn't get into the screening. And so I just heard word of mouth afterwards and there was so much passionate hatred for that film at Cannes <laughs> that year. I was like, right, I, I'm going to, I'll probably just leave this one. Um, but then actually that meeting that I talked about earlier, the one that I had with Elf, um, she mentioned it in the meeting. Um, we also talked about another Lars von Trier movie, um, but she mentioned that one specifically. And yeah, I don't want to get into spoilers, but there's something, there, there's a connection between uh, A Little More Flesh and Antichrist. So I watched it mm. and yeah, I was kind of in, in shock by it, the whole film. <laughs> I think it's an amazing, amazing piece of work. Um, and actually talked to Mary Wilde about it um, afterwards and she gave me kind of um, some information and interpretation uh, that completely changed the dynamic of kind of the whole film for me. I'm just going to go into this a little bit um, now. Sure, sure. Yeah, Antichrist is basically about the loss of Von Trier's mother and the emotional crisis that that led to. Um, And yeah, after Mary told me that, it's absolutely the only interpretation I can have about this film now. But yeah, in terms of the basic information, Von Trier's mother told him on his deathbed that his father wasn't his real father. And um, he actually grew up thinking he was Jewish and he wasn't. Um, And if you add to that the fact that his real father was German and Lars Von Trier's existence was essentially the product of a eugenic experiment to create an artist um, and like I say, skip ahead to Mary for more on that. Um, you can sort of start to see where his horrific Nazi joke at can came from. But yeah, it, it, it comes from that kind of trolling instinct that Von Trier has, um, which I think is tied to his self-loathing, which has had significant negative impacts on his life. Um, but that self-loathing is also a key part of what makes his work so incredible. Um So, yeah, basically, I think Antichrist is an incredibly brave film. It's an artist confronting the root of his depression in the depths of his depression. Um, He wrote it while in a psychiatric hospital recovering from clinical depression. And he shot it in recovery. Um, Charlotte Gainsbourg said that he was very intense and there wasn't a lot of talking. Um, But she also said that she knew that it was a special experience that she wouldn't have again anytime soon. And... Yeah, I think wow. all of that contributes mm-hmm. to the insane power of this film. Um, how do you feel about it, Mike? Yeah, I, I, th- this was actually my first Lars von Trier film. So I, oh my I, god, I know I saw it. I guess relatively early on for the film. I think I probably saw it about a year or two after it came out, and mm-hmm. by this point, I hadn't seen any of his stuff, and I came to it as a horror fan so i right. i came to it as you know th- hearing that it was this quite extreme gory horror film that had shocked people at can and stuff and watched it and you know it's not really that is it i mean it is it's got some shocking stuff in it but it's it's a lot more than that and actually it kind of blew me away and then it was from that that i then was like wow okay i need to go back and and then i sought out and watched dancer in the dark and breaking the waves and everything wow. else so this was the film that kind of made me a Lars fan I suppose um it is a it's a weird film it's it's a hard watch actually I don't think it's the easiest film of his to sit through and I know that none of his films are particularly easy but actually I think that some of his films are even the more nasty ones are a little bit more accessible than this film it's quite sort of um slow paced and it's quite oblique um I 
you know, I think it's hard to tell at times what this film is and where it's going. Is this going to be some sort of psychological movie? Is it supernatural? Is it a sort of folk horror? And it takes a really long time to sort of unravel and and show its hand, I guess, which makes it, I think, sometimes quite a difficult watch when you first see it. But I think by the time you get to the end of that journey, it's so worth it. And it's really feel it really feels like him going through something personal, doesn't it? I mean, obviously the film, and we'll talk about this, but it's about loss and it's about grief and it's about depression and so much else. And and it really does feel like uh, the the main the, the main word I could use to describe this film is raw. Like everything mm. about this film, like the performances feel so raw, and everything about it feels like it's kind of he's just sort of spilling his guts out on screen in a way, in a really kind of open uncomfortable way you know and um it's really something to see isn't it That's yeah thing. Uh, absolutely and i, I really uh, i'm really glad that you don't see it kind of as a, a traditional horror film because i i don't think it is really um it, it definitely has horror elements obviously but i think it's a horrifying film like i, I think yes that he's using cinematic techniques to create psychological discomfort for his audience um, which includes how they've edited it. And mm-hmm. I think that's partly why I think some people have reacted so strongly against it. I don't think he wants to horrify them as much as he wants to make them feel incredibly, incredibly uncomfortable. I think there's a lot of cognitive dissonance in Antichrist. Um, yeah. But yeah, all of his films contain some element of horror, I'd say. Like they all contain something insanely disturbing. Like Breaking the Waves has a scene that fucks me up more than The Exorcist. Agreed. 100% agreed. Yeah, there's something far more emotionally impactful, I think, about some of his films. Even, yeah. I mean, uh, for me, Melancholia, I think is my favourite film of his. And, mm. and it's because it was one that's so deeply... I couldn't sleep after watching Melancholia. And, and that's oh. not a horror film by any means, but it's just such a, a gut-wrenching watch, you know? Yeah, um, yeah. So, Antichrist, let me ask you just a, a little bit about, I guess, just just the filmmaking itself. I mean, we talked about Lars kind of being this guy who pioneered this idea of um, sort of uh, pared down, I guess you mm. could call it, filmmaking, sort of handheld and not using artificial lighting and sets and everything else. This film kind of feels like it's sort of the opposite to that. That You know, it starts off with that incredible sequence with the, 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 the our lead couple, you know, Charlotte Gainsbourg and, and uh, Willem Dafoe having sex while this toddler climbs out the window and falls to his death. And it's all done in sort of slow motion in this kind mm. of gorgeous black and white. Mm. And then as the film goes on, we have these amazing kind of almost look like sort of tableaus or paintings right the mm-hmm. shots of you know them in the woods and the trees and all of that kind of stuff um what do you think of of just the way this film looks i suppose because in some ways up until this point it feels quite un un Lars in a lot of ways do you know what i mean absolutely uh, one of the kind of interesting evolutions about uh Lars von Trier's work is mm. that like he kind of changes up his influences and a lot of them kind of come from outside of cinema. So yes. Dogville comes from theatre, obviously, and um, Dance in the Dark is music. But with this kind of era, it really feels like he's influenced by paintings, as you say. Um, yeah. And I just, you know, stuff like this, and especially Melancholia, and it pops up again in House That Jack Built, that painterly influence. Um, and yeah, I just I think it's a, a beautiful film. You're absolutely right. It's the opposite of uh, Dogma ninety five in every single <laughs> yeah. way. Um, Dogma films have to be entirely in color, so you've got that black and white sequence. Mm-hmm. You're not allowed to murder anyone in them. Um, you're not allowed to use techniques that can't be achieved handheld, uh, yeah. and you can't use any sound that isn't captured in the moment. So you would have to teach a fox to speak if you wanted to make a dogma <laughs> antichrist. Um, and I'm not, I'm not sure you'd want to do that. Um, yeah. <laughs> exactly that, and and there you go again. You know, he is. He's a rule breaker. He breaks mm. even his own rules. I suppose yeah. that's the thing, doesn't he? Um, and I guess you know. 
right at the center of this film really uh, other than the filmmaking itself is these two performances isn't it mm. you know really we we don't really spend i mean a- apart from the sun and you know some animals we really yeah. spend this entire film with just two actors willem dafoe and charlotte gainsbourg and they don't even have character names do they i think they're just him and her is that yeah right? that's yeah. right that's right yeah what do you think of these two uh these two characters and the way they're portrayed here by these actors um, I think that uh, the fact that they're not named probably means that they're allegorical. Um, uh-huh. But even though they're technically ciphers, uh, I think that the performances of the actors, just incredible perfection, brave... God. Um, you know, I don't. I don't really know what more I can say about them. They're literally next level performances, working with incredibly difficult material, like the hardest possible material. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And I can't. I you know. It can't have been a barrel of laughs, can it, of make, making this film, I imagine. <laughs> you know, like, you know, Lars being in the kind of the headspace that he was in and then kind of embodying these characters and working through this stuff. It must have been a strange, strange experience, I imagine, for everyone involved making this film. Yeah, you can kind of see it in some of the interviews that they've the actors have given about the film and certainly at the Cannes press conference, um there's kind of a weird vibe hanging around the the set of this one um which isn't to say that something illegal or wrong happened um uh, but i do think that it was a really dark place for all of them um and yeah. and they both you know they both love lars uh, you know um i'm certainly not suggesting that anything bad happened uh, to anyone on the set of this film but no i mean these are both two actors that have worked with lars several times aren't they so exactly love working with him yeah exactly um but yeah i i really think that with material like this you do need a lightness on set and that's not what they were getting i don't think so i Uh think this must have been bordering on traumatic in order to actually make this film that that does induce trauma in its audience like it is it is honestly one of the darkest films ever made (laughs) what do you think of the way that Lars um what do you think of the way in which there is sort of I guess you'd call it hardcore sex right and and this Mm. is something that he carries through to Nymphomaniac where actors actually had porn doubles and there was proper sort of penetration in his films and that is right in the opening scene you're, you're you're not even sort of two minutes into Antichrist and you're seeing sort of full you know full genital penetration basically right yeah. straight away um what do you think of that I, you know I always think it's an interesting choice to put in this film and I guess it kind of is there almost because of what then ultimately ends up happening at the end in terms of some of the body horror right but what do you think of that choice to I guess bear all uh, when it comes to the sex and the way these bodies are portrayed I think that it can be read on a couple of levels I think that um, certainly Mary will go into this in more detail in Uh her section there's a reading connected to what Mary's going to say but that word connected I think that he's showing a literal physical connection um, in the opening of, of the film that gets taken to such an extreme disconnect by the end mm-hmm. um you know not to spoil it for anyone but things do happen to genitals in this movie oh yeah and we can don't worry we can go full spoilers because I've, I've got to ask you about the end so <laughs> yeah fair <laughs> <laughs> but yeah that's true the, 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 their genitalia is a very um it's an important part of the plot towards the it, end isn't it, it? Is. that's the thing yeah yeah, yeah. so you know it, it's Chekhov's genitalia <laughs> <laughs> that's it that is exactly it um he he actually uh, you know and i for um i must admit i'm not a big i'm not massively up on my tarkovsky mm-hmm. uh films i've seen solaris and i think i've seen mirror and that's it right um but he dedicated this film to tarkovsky didn't he and i know you sam you're quite a big fan i mean you, you there are references to tarkovsky in your film right yeah um do you kind of see a connection between the cinema of Tarkovsky and Antichrist? Right. 
so this this is really interesting. I, I, th- this is going to turn into a slight waffle, I'm afraid, Mike. But but this is kind of quite intrinsic in his work. Yeah. Um, because obviously there, there's shots in Antichrist that remind me of Tarkovsky's Stalker. Um, right. But I actually think that the dedication is a dark joke. I think he's trolling Tarkovsky um, <laughs> yeah. because Lars's feature making career. Um, began with a Tarkovsky homage. Um, the opening shot of the element of crime is a donkey rolling over to get to his feet. And it's almost exactly the same as the horse that, that rolls to get to its feet in Andre Rublev. Right. And it is 100% intentional. Um, there's other direct Tarkovsky lifts early on in, in Von Trier's career. Um, But obviously there's a big difference in terms of the animal chosen between a donkey and a horse. And a donkey is kind of less than a horse in terms of iconography, just as the Antichrist is less than what Tarkovsky believed in. He was a deeply religious Orthodox Christian. And a horse is kind of associated with strength and beauty and power, whereas a donkey symbolises stubbornness and ugliness and a lack of cooperation. Um, so in many ways, it's kind of the perfect image to begin Lars von Trier's career of uh, self-loathing. But the connection between element of crime and Tarkovsky goes a little deeper um, because obviously Tarkovsky is associated with spirituality and religion and beauty and empathy. Um, but he did do a couple of things that are worse than anything Lars von Trier has ever done. Um, he included a shot of a horse being injured for real in Andre Rublev. And von Trier has actually talked about Tarkovsky's collaborator, Frederick Gorenstein's belief that Tarkovsky's death was a punishment from God because he dropped that horse down that ladder. And so von Trier has always had an interest in Tarkovsky. He's paid homage several times, but here he's made a film in Antichrist that is antithetical to Tarkovsky's beliefs and is almost using his own techniques for evil. (laughs) Um, Mm. So I think he's trolling with that dedication. I really do. That is really interesting. Wow. I didn't know that. That's really cool. Um, I, yeah, I need to, I need to, I need to check out more Tarkovsky. I need to watch Stalker actually. That's been on my list for a long time and I haven't, I still haven't caught it yet. So both Stalker and Andre Rublev, like Andre Rublev is probably my favorite. Ah, okay. Even though it does have that horrifying moment in it. Um, the film as a whole is uh, an incredible piece. I, I think you'd like it. This what's really interesting as well about Antichrist is that you know it it's a it, you know it's interesting. I was talking about it in this context of the sort of horror of the mind and horror of the body, mm. and which I think it kind of fits perfectly because it's so much about. Um, sort of these characters what they're going through psychologically and then it kind of manifests right physically towards the end but there is also a sort of spirituality here there is almost something of a almost something of an occult horror film do you know what i mean i mean the Mm. the film is called antichrist there Mm. is this all of these references to sort of satan and satan's playground and and i don't know that they're also I don't know whether there is a, a, a strictly a reading on that, but it almost feels like this could be some sort of religious, supernatural, spiritual sort of horror film as well. Do you know what I mean? It feels like it kind of teases that. Yeah, and, and this is where it, it does go into that Tarkovsky territory where his films are incredibly spiritual. They right. come from a deep, deep spiritual place, all of them. Um, it's all about his relationship with his God and um, various other kind of themes, but but it's, they're all so connected to religion. So that's why I kind of say that Antichrist is like an evil Tarkovsky movie because <laughs> yeah. it, it really does feel like an invasion. I, I was going to say inversion, actually, but invasion is is yeah. uh, is a great Freudian slip, but. Um, yeah, yeah. yeah. It, it's like he's kind of it's almost like an exorcism um, <laughs> yes. if, if you want yes. to look at it in terms of the occult because he's trying to 
face on the the root cause of his depression he's trying to face off against that um to try and rid himself from it through art basically um so yeah i love it that's great so let's talk about the body horror then because again you know whether or not you call this a horror film is up is up for Mm -hmm. debate but certainly the final act gets pretty nasty right um what do you think of it i mean just on a very superficial level you know how do you think it looks how do you think it's pulled off how effective do you find it these scenes of genital mutilation essentially is what it is right you've got willem defoe's penis which is kind of smashed in with a rock she then sort of mass like she she basically wanks him off until he bleeds and then uh, and then she i guess you could say sort of circumcises herself with scissors right um it's a really i find really difficult difficult to watch how did you find those scenes of gore and body horror well i like i say like these were basically the elements that kind of put me off seeing it in the first place Mm -hmm. um that and i was told that the filmmaking itself was crap right really yeah like people really fucking hated this film at Cannes and they just they just thought it was shit. <laughs> um, wow. And I'm like, well, I'm not going to sit through bad filmmaking in order yeah. to get to something that's going to make me feel like curling up in a corner for the rest of the day. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but I, having now watched it and, and experienced it and and kind of discussed it and all the rest of it, um i don't think it could have ended in any other way um Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. i think it's incredible like the the film makes you feel psychological discomfort throughout like we talked about because of certain techniques that he's using and and very unusual editing choices and all of this stuff that kind of never really lets you immerse yourself in the world it's constantly pushing you away um but also drawing you in so you do have this weird cognitive dissonance where it's fascinating but also repulsive and so it kind of opens with one of the most powerful taboos in cinema which is the death of a child um, uh-huh. but doesn't really show it and does it in a very kind of artistic way. Um, and then we we get the ending, which is other taboos, but you see them in the most graphic way possible. Yeah. Um, and it's about that kind of separation. It's something we've talked about quite a lot on this series. We talked about it a lot with Cronenberg. And actually, even even um, last week, we talked about uh, The Human Centipede 2. And it was actually something that the actor Lawrence Harvey talked about, about how it's these kind of internalised pain becoming externalised, right, in a very visceral, explicit way. And yeah. that is exactly what it feels like happens right in this it almost feels like it's the it's the natural progression of of their pain it feels almost almost weirdly inevitable i think that it ends in this bloodshed and mutilation right in the final act of this film yeah Um, i mean you know to to put it simply those genitals created the source of their pain yes um and they're getting rid of it yeah it's a, yeah exactly it's like a revenge film on their own genitals basically. Yeah, exactly yeah. <laughs> um and so there you go so let me before we move on to the house that jack built i mean uh, let me just ask you briefly about um you talked about and i find this really interesting especially because you were at can so you know i only know what i've read but it sounds as though the sort of critic and audience responses i guess as with all Lars films were incredibly polarized right Mm. um people kind of loved it or hated it do you feel that opinions of the film have kind of changed over the last decade have people kind of yeah have have people kind of come around to sort of seeing what Lars was saying or even gone in the opposite direction and hated it even more what do you think I think that um, you have to kind of think about the context of Cannes because these people, they're not like, oh, what should I do tonight? Oh, I'll go and watch Lars von Trier's new film. Oh, what's it about? Oh, I'll 
read some reviews. They're going in completely cold, not by their own choice. And imagine being confronted by this film, <laughs> right? <laughs> it, in a kind of non-consensual way. It's like, it, it's an attack. It's it's an assault. And so I can totally see why people came out of it in, in shock and and you know being upset and and this happens with von Trier. like there's a story of commode shouting at the screen um, yes what film yes. is it is it the idiots that i think it was breaking the waves actually i think he, he vocally stood up and shouted at the at the screen right because he hated it so much so so you know that that's an insight to the kind of thing that can be provoked by von Trier's work yeah. Now, in terms of people changing their minds, I know one person who's changed his mind. Uh, and I think for everyone else, they're able to see the film in the context of all the responses to it. So I think people are now a bit more prepared for what they, they're in for with Antichrist. Yeah. And it doesn't obey any of the conventional rules and you don't really know what you're watching. And it is, mm. I do think sometimes films like that, I do need two or three viewings to really kind of form my opinion about them. Do you know what I mean? It's yeah. like you say, it's it's all the context and it's all what you're expecting versus what you get and everything mm. else, I think, you know? Totally. Um, so there you go. So Antichrist, it, it's it's a film that you would recommend to people then, I take it? Well, uh, yeah, I mean, with a caveat that, like, <laughs> it is going to fuck up your evening. Like, there's, <laughs> you know, I think it's a, an amazing work of art. I'm glad it exists. I'm probably not going to return to it anytime soon, but, yeah. um, you know, I, I think that it's a really, really important film in Von Trier's canon. I agree. What a powerful film this is. Shocking, mm. confrontational, powerful, devastating. I love it. Um, so before we move on to the next film, we've got to hear from one of Lars von Trier's biggest fans in the world and regular contributor to this podcast, Mary Wilde. Now, Sam has already alluded to this. Mary's got plenty to say on both these films. So let's head over to our first Wild About Horror segment of the episode as Mary lends us her thoughts on Lars von Trier's Antichrist. <laughs> Hey Mike, Mary Wild calling, and I'm delighted to turn my Freudian gaze onto Maestro Lars von Trier, my beloved Danish enfant terrible, the polymorphously phobic auteur who commands the attention of cinephiles like no other. Even those who claim to despise Lars on the grounds that he defiles the sanctity of human decency speak of him in the most ardent tones. He seems to live rent-free in their head, ain't it always the way? Lars admits he enjoys playing devil's advocate and presents contradictory viewpoints in his work for the sake of generating discussion. He believes that it's quite important not to be loved by everybody because then you've failed. File this under words to live by. His motto is that a film should be like a stone in your shoe, which has two meanings. One, that original art is created by placing restrictions on the filmmaking process, ensuring that a director is distinguished from his contemporaries. And two, that a good film stays with the spectator, bothering him, interrupting everyday actions like a stone in his shoe. This is aligned with the notion that the goal of the filmmaker mustn't be to please everyone. Rather, the object should be to make an impact, even if it's a negative one. Controversy is a vehicle for provoking deeper thought, advancing the discourse beyond polite society's comfort zone. A real artist isn't concerned with winning popularity contests or having their ego stroked. Ahead of my analysis of Antichrist, here's an interesting bit of intel. Lars von Trier's mother lied to him about his paternity. Just before she died in 1989, she revealed that his biological father is not the man he grew up with. Ulf Trier, a Jewish civil servant, was her partner and the man who raised Lars, but she'd had an affair with Fritz Michael Hartmann, a Catholic German classical musician, in order to intentionally give her baby artistic genes. So not only was Lars left grieving the death of his mother, but he lost his dad too. His cultural identity and family lineage were now a source of confusion. 
He felt manipulated and angry and suffered clinical depression as a result. Antichrist is an experimental horror film in which Lars von Trier processes his mommy issues. He wrote the screenplay in 2006 while hospitalized due to a major depressive episode. The vision for the film was sparked after Lars watched a documentary about the original forests in Europe, portrayed as a dark, nightmarish place of great pain, as different species tried to kill and eat each other. He wanted to emphasize the paradox of nature perceived as a romantic and peaceful place, even though nature is a better approximation of hell. Hence the line in the film, nature is Satan's church. His mother's paternity reveal served as a major influence in what would eventually come to be known as the Depression Trilogy, comprising of Antichrist, Melancholia, and Nymphomaniac, featuring complex female characters who are stand-ins for Lars himself, staging his debilitating despair, existential angst, and loneliness. Lars conceived Antichrist as a horror film because it allowed for, as he put it, a lot of very strange images. This is a testament to the horror medium having the capacity to accommodate otherwise inexpressible psychological states. He said it was a fun way of working through his depression. Critics generally praised Antichrist's artistic execution, but remained polarized about its substantive merit. Apparently, some were scandalized because of the clitoris cutting scene. Poor darlings. In the opening sequence of Antichrist, a child falls from an apartment window while his parents have sex. There's a link here to the biblical story of the expulsion from the Garden of Eden, a transition from innocence into sin. The evil nature of human beings is said to be inherited as a consequence of the fall from grace. In the Bible, Eve is the culprit because she disobeyed God. And so, too, in Antichrist, does Lars blame his mother for his descent into suffering. The crucial element is that the mother, who remains nameless, reinforcing her archetypal status, is aware of the danger awaiting her child, but she does nothing to protect him. Here resides the innermost crisis for Lars, that the mother is preoccupied with the pursuit of her own desire, that her erotic activity and life instinct are at odds with the well-being of her own baby, an upsetting idea that is further developed in Nymphomaniac, deviating from the basic assumption that mothers are always nurturing and that the kid is priority numero uno. Antichrist is a revenge movie. The specter of the dead baby compels the guilt-stricken mother to turn garden shears on her own vulva, the site onto which birth and death coalesce. When the generator of pleasure is removed from the mother, her will to live ceases to exist. Lars is hitting her where it really hurts. Following her baby's death, the woman is overwhelmed with grief and is hospitalized. Her equally unnamed husband casts doubt on the psychiatric care she is receiving and decides to take over her treatment with CBT. She seems to be pathologically afraid of Eden, the woods. Her psychotherapist husband guides her through a visualization exercise. I want you to melt into the green, he says on the train as they head to the woods. Just turn green. In a way, he is coaching her to surrender and be contained inside his discourse. Depression becomes the battleground of a power play in their marriage, and he thinks he possesses expert knowledge to provide relief. What the mind can conceive and believe, it can achieve. His glib platitude takes for granted a monumental pain. He co-ops her torment merely to prove an academic point. It's an entirely egotistical endeavor. He is suspicious when she seems to spontaneously recover not long after they arrive at Eden. He encounters a talking fox in the forest that declares chaos reigns, prefiguring that he is not out of the woods yet. The fear of Eden presents a cinematic treatment of origin myths as a source of anxiety and dread. That is to say, we would rather not identify with the primary traumatizing incident. We amass a host of defense mechanisms to ensure the memory is vanquished, but no reprieve is possible until we pass through the psychological conflict zone. In Antichrist, the woman writes a thesis on witch hunts. She is supposed to be critical while researching gynocide, but over time starts to believe the idea that women are evil. Her husband is repulsed and reproaches her for imbibing the misogynistic views she had set out to find fault with. 
But as the Polaroid photos show, the child's shoe was always placed on the wrong foot by his mother, confirming that she had wanted to harm the baby all along. Her very nature, her psychological disposition, externalized as the woods, is dominated by dark impulses. And weirdly, there is something liberating about this realization. This is Lars von Trier condemning his mother's IRL eugenics experiment, but he's simultaneously identifying with her, admitting that he too is capable of committing offenses because he's not separate from her. He's not separate from the violence of nature. He's part of it as well. It's a very touching film because in the process of revealing his mother's cruelty, he also sides with the aggressive representation of her. Despite the lasting damage caused by her bombshell confession, he somehow rises above the temptation of abandoning his mother in the wilderness. Catch you later on in the episode. Oh, a big thank you to the brilliant Mary Wilde. I've been so excited to hear Mary's thoughts on that film. And Mary will be back for another segment later on in this episode to tell us what she thinks of the house that Jack built. So, before we move on to the next film, I'm just going to take a moment to thank this week's sponsor, $20 patron Dave Middleton. Uh, Dave says, Hi Mike, I had been a $10 patron for some time, but I enjoy EOH so much, I decided to take the plunge and go for the $20 Monsters package. Thank you for all your hard work. The podcast is outstanding, especially in these trying times. You've really helped a lot of us stay positive and discover or revisit some excellent films. Thank you, Dave. Now, Dave tells me uh, he is a singer, songwriter, and he's also in a band. He's the lead singer in a band called Sea of Shadows, uh, and I've just checked them out, and they sound excellent, and there are some excellent Dave vocals. Here's a little snippet. Check it out. Now something's telling me to cry. Something's telling me to cry. Because she's making me so happy I could die. You chase away the demon The cap pushing me aside Uh, If anyone wants to hear more of that, the band is called Sea of Shadows and you can check out their SoundCloud, soundcloud.com slash Sea of Shadows Band. Uh, Dave also sings in a covers band called Skywriters and they cover mostly alt-90s bands like Pearl Jam and Soundgarden. That sounds incredible as well. You can find them on Facebook at Skywriters Band. Uh, and not only that, Dave's got God, Dave's got loads of stuff going on. He's got a, he's got a Facebook page that covers all things horror. A Facebook group called the Crypt Keepers Vault. Uh, Dave says it's a place where we chat films, and I also have many photos of my extensive collections of everything from the good old VHS days to Blu-rays. Amazing! So there you go. So if you want to get involved in that group, that's called the Crypt Keepers Vault which Dave runs. You can find that on Facebook. I will link to all of these things in the show notes. One more time then, a huge shout out and a very special thank you to this week's sponsor, $20 patron Dave Middleton. And if you want to become an official Evolution of Horror sponsor like Dave, you can sign up to our Patreon. And if you sign up at a $20 level, you will get access to every single bonus episode in our back catalogue, of which there are now well over 100. And and you'll become a sponsor, which means you will get your very own little segment just like this one in the middle of an upcoming episode in which you can ask me to plug literally anything you want me to. Um, or you can just read me a message for me to read out on the episode, anything you like. Uh, head on over to patreon.com slash evolution of horror. That's patreon.com slash evolution of horror. Okay, let's return to my discussion with Sam Ashurst as we move on to our second Lars von Trier film. This one I have mixed feelings about. Here is our spoilerific discussion of The House That Jack Built from 2018. Your house is a fine little house, Jack. Are you allowed to speak along the way? I was thinking there might be rules. Let me put it this way. Very few make it all the way without uttering a word. But do carry on merrily. Just don't believe you're going to tell me something I haven't heard before. Oops. 
That was maybe a mistake. What was maybe a mistake? Me getting in this car with you. You might as well be a serial killer. Sorry, but you do kind of look like one. We follow Jack, a serial killer who also goes by the name Mr. Sophistication, as he looks back on his life whilst being taken uh, to hell. And there's also some stuff about building a house. <laughs> there is. There is. There's like serial killer stuff. There's like going to hell. There's house building. There's all sorts. Um, so tell me about your reaction to this film when you first saw it and just what your general thoughts are on on the house that Jack built. So um, on the 15th of May, 2018, <laughs> <laughs> I came out of the can screening and um, heard a bit of backlash, saw a bit of backlash on Twitter and stuff. And so I kind of wrote a very quick reaction in the moment to the, the backlash that I was seeing at the time. Here's what I said. The house that Jack built, cinema as confession. I've never seen a clearer communication of the potential toxicity of artistry. Manipulation, intimidation, frustration, repetition, exploitation, plagiarism, objectification, all in the pursuit of carving a legacy. It's tedious and cruel because filmmaking can be tedious and cruel. More <laughs> companion piece than masterpiece, but what an ending, brackets, potentially to a career. Um, now, that was literally uh, as I came out of the film and I've since revised that reaction I actually do think the film's a masterpiece, not just a companion piece, <laughs> um, because I have a slightly deeper reading of it after seeing it again. Um, I still think it's about his career as a director because there is so much in it on that topic. Um, but I also think it's about his trauma at being abandoned by and rejected from Can, uh, his safe uh -huh. space. Um, I think that event instigated the self-exploration of this movie and uh, we'll get on to the reasons why. I love it. Well, I, um, you know, we've kind of alluded to this already. I'm not the biggest fan of this film. And actually, no. what's really interesting is I think you, that review you just read of you from 2018, I think kind of perfectly encapsulates sort of what I feel about that film. I I don't think it's a masterpiece. I kind of agree with the Sam of, t of, of three <laughs> years ago. Um, I do obviously get that it's, it's, it's about him, it's about his career, it's about all of those things that you put so perfectly there. Um, I, I think my... And I was trying to figure out what it was about this film that did, doesn't connect with me compared to some of his others. And I think it's partly what we talked about, that so many of his other films are, for me emotional exercises they are whether or not they are shocking or cruel or trolling me they still make me feel something they still make me feel devastated or shocked or whatever um and i i just feel that i feel I was left a bit cold with the mm. house that Jack built. And I wonder whether it's got something to do with the character of Jack, which we'll get into. You know, mm. he doesn't have this kind of, I don't know, emotionally empathetic female character at the centre of this. Instead, he has this very cold, um, sociopathic, psychopathic, you know, male character. I don't know. It's very long. And I found that it was... I don't know. It felt almost like it was Lars von Trier making an essay about his his own career. A hundred percent. I mean, it's <laughs> it's basically. I kind of see it not so much as a film, but as as you say, a video essay. Yeah, um, yeah. Maybe maybe that's partly uh, you know as, as somebody who every day for his day job makes video essays. Maybe <laughs> that's partly why why I was recoiling a little bit. But I I don't know. Yeah, I think I just. I, I, you know, when I sit down to watch a Lars von Trier film, I kind of want to be shocked. I want to be provoked. I want to see something I have never seen before. And I, I, I just kept thinking with every chapter of this film, with every scene of this film, I thought, I've seen you do this before, Lars, but better in other films. Do you know what I mean? So that's kind of, that's how I felt first time round. I watched it again last night and there's still a hell of a lot of stuff that I really 
admire and respect mm. about it. I don't think it's a bad film by any means, but I think for me, it's just that much more of a struggle because I don't have any emotional connection to it. I just, I'm watching it more as a sort of almost academic exercise than I am this kind of, yeah, gut wrenching emotional experience that some of his other, some of my favourite films of his give me. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, no, I completely, completely understand that perspective um Mm -hmm. for me i love lars right i I love him as an artist and i kind of love him as a person now in order to say that i do have to address you know certain situations that have come to light um specifically the bjork accusations um and you know i wasn't there and i don't know the situation and um i certainly don't doubt uh, how bjork felt about the events um Mm -hmm. i think she's telling the truth just to just to sort of clarify sam for people that don't know is this tell us a little bit about what you mean so bjork basically has spoken out right about she was treated pretty badly by Lars, right? As, as far exactly. as I'm aware, for, on, it, on Dancer in the Dark. Is that right? Yeah, it, it was kind of... It's accusations of bullying, but it also folds into Me Too. It was kind of part yeah. of the Me Too movement. Um, and some of it was, like, sexualized language and right. her feeling very uncomfortable. Um, like him saying that he was going to climb over, in like... a basically go into her room at night or something like that um, while his partner was present and um, basically things that no one should say to a colleague um, Mm -hmm. basically and again just like the Nazi stuff I'm not defending what was said I'm just trying to provide a little bit of context. And, and we should probably say, actually, Sam, as well, because we've mentioned it in, in passing a couple of times, and I think all of this is relevant to the house that Jack built. Uh, let's just, for anyone out there who didn't hear about the Nazi f- fuckery uh, that happened at Cannes a few years ago with Lars, um, correct me if I'm wrong, Sam, but he was he was in Cannes promoting melancholia at the time, right? And he was at a pref- press conference, he was sat next to Kirsten Dunst, and he made a joke, a really bad, poor taste joke about Nazism, about something to do with sort of, th- that he sympathised with Nazis or something like that? I, I, I think he basically said um, that he was a Nazi, Right, okay, right. yeah. And and then sort of there's a kind of real awful, awkward reaction where nobody laughs. And then instead of kind of cutting it off there, Lars just keeps going. And yeah. it's like he's digging and digging. And, and Kirsten Dunst is like physically kind of recoiling, isn't she? She's slowly like shrinking into her chair next to him. And he just keeps going. And... And because of that, he was um, he was banned, right? He was like persona non grata at Cannes after that after that year, wasn't he? Yeah, exactly. He was, you know, we weren't sure if he was ever going to be welcomed back. Yeah, like, he was just straight up banned. And you know, again, I totally understand where where Cam was coming from. I think they are there are layers to that quote unquote joke. Like it's not funny. That that that's the thing. It's not funny. Um, it's just awkward and uncomfortable. But he is talking about that traumatic event from his childhood. Um, yeah. You know, he is trying to make make light of the fact that he thought he was Jewish. He's not. You know, he didn't realise he was German. And um, yeah, yeah, that's the, right. The, the that's weird right. eugenics element of the whole thing. So oh, I, I think he's making a weird joke about that that horrible event from his past. But but Can is like a home for Von Trier. Like it's been the location of so much happiness for him, going all the way back to the film I was talking about earlier, to his first film, The Element of Crime, which won the technical grand prize and was nominated for the Palme d'Or um, mm. way back in 1984. Um, and the element of crime was divisive amongst critics, and Dirk Bogard apparently threatened to quit the can jury if it won a prize. Um, and I'm sure Von Trier loved all of that. But I think the the controversy over his statements in that press conference and the 
subsequent banning yes. would have profoundly injured him, actually. Um, yeah. And I yeah. think that I really think that this film slash video essay is him wrestling with his career, his wrestling with his personality, and he's wrestling with all the things that kind of led up to this kind of more recent traumatic event. And it's it's there, like it, it's just it's in the text. It's not even subtext, really. Yeah. It's, it's really clear. Um, uh, yeah, there are there. I I totally get what you mean, and there are certain scenes that I really look at in that way in particular. And we can get into this as we go, but I really mm. think, particularly for me, the second chapter where he is, he, there's the it's quite comedic. It's probably my favourite section of the film where Jack is kind of. He's like a slave to his own obsessions and compulsions, right? So in this sequence, he's just murdered a woman, brutally murdered a woman, uh, alone in her house. He's about to leave the crime scene. Everything is looking fine for him in terms of getting away with it. But then he realises that he might have missed a piece of evidence that he has to get rid of his fingerprints from, or he has to, you know, clean a bit of evidence up. So he goes back into the house. And then the the sequence just goes on and on and on, and it goes on forever. But it's like every time he leaves, he realises there's something else that he needs to go back and check and he goes back into the house and back into the house um and it's it's a comedic scene it's a really interesting scene and and it did make me think of Lars von Trier this uh, this man who cannot stop himself you know he can't you know every time he should stop what he's doing he can't help but push it a little further <laughs> or push people's buttons a little more you know whether oh, it's a can or in interviews or whatever it might be um there is a sort of obsession and a compulsive nature to Lars's uh, personality that I think is is present in this scene and it, you know Lars is his own worst enemy in that regard just yes. like Jack is and Jack ends up leaving that scene you know dragging a dead body behind him literally kind of shouting to the world what he's done while David Bowie's fame plays in the background right and I I, I just feel like that is a massive allegory for Lars von Trier you know kind of a victim of his own success I guess you know trapped in the spotlight with people noticing all of his own flaws and neuroses and issues and you know him kind of almost destroying himself because of that a hundred percent but literally like the whole film is soaked in it like there's one kind of detail i want to pull out that that ties a lot of things together um lars is a really dedicated fan of john cassavetes um Mm -hmm. And you could say that the Dogma 95 movement was almost entirely inspired by Cassavetes. Um, And there's a character called Mr. Sophistication, which is obviously the serial killer's name in House that Jack Built, um, that appears in The Killing of a Chinese Bookie, the Cassavetes movie. And what's really interesting about that is that Mr. Sophistication is a surrogate for Ben Gazzara's character Cosmo, and Cosmo is a surrogate for Cassavetes. Cassavetes has said as much in interviews. Right. So this is kind of one of many clues that Jack is a surrogate for, for Von Trier um, that's kind of operating at, at different levels. Um, mm-hmm. y- yeah. You know, let me just start off by asking you, what do you think of Matt Dillon and and, and Jack as a character? Because like I said, I personally struggle a bit with with Jack as a character and it's not it's not Matt Dillon's performance but it's just that I it's a film that I struggle to connect with on any kind of empathetic or emotional level I suppose and I think that's partly because of the character of Jack but what do you think of him and and Matt Dillon's performance and and how he kind of I guess holds this film together? I think yeah there's kind of two questions there I guess in terms of the performance I think it is absolutely incredible like uh-huh. I, I i genuinely think this is matt dylan's best performance um there are so many like oh, like moments where he kind of it's the expressions he makes it's it's the the light in his eyes going at it's like a really really dark disturbing performance it, it feels like he actually is a psychopath to me um but Yeah, and there's a slightly troubling element to it in that I find him slightly attractive in moments Uh in this film. Yeah, 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 (laughs) yeah. um, Like, the, and this is really troubling, but in the hunting sequence, (laughs) 
<laughs> it's just the way he looks, right? It's not anything that he's doing. <laughs> yeah. But it's that stubble and the moustache and like even his outfit, apart from the, you know, MAGA hat that he's he's Yeah, wearing. it's very MAGA, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Um yeah. but no, there's there's something about him that I do find attractive, so maybe that's confusing me a little bit. But um, <laughs> Yeah, I just think yeah. I think he's absolutely absolutely incredible in this film and there is something to that about we've talked quite a lot already on this series about serial killers and serial killer movies and it's mm. always a it's always a slightly murky thing i find um you know particularly ones that kind of allude to real life crimes and serial killers but mm. serial killers are so often played by such sexy charismatic men right whether it's anthony hopkins as hannibal lecter or or zach efron as mm. ted bundy um and we as people do have a kind of attraction to slash fascination with serial killers, right? And I think there's something in that that Lars is sort of commenting on in this film, right? Yeah, well, I I, I just think that if you're going to tell any kind of honest movie or story about a serial killer or about a psychopath, you do actually have to include that element um, because there is something charismatic about the psychopath it, it's kind of yeah. part of how they operate um it's part of how they're successful in the horrific yeah, things yeah. they do um they are able to attract people um and you know some of them are kind of hideously physically repulsive um but they have that weird charisma that enables them to kind of trick people um and so, yeah, I think that if you are going to tell a serial killer story, you do have to include that. Um, yeah. The particularly scary element, if only so that people can kind of look out for it in real life. Um, yeah, you're right. Yeah. You're right. Um, let me ask you about the framing device as well. Like the, the, the whole film is narrated by Jack. Yes. And he is telling a man called Verge the sort of the story of his life through these five incidents right and we don't until the end we don't see either of them we don't see verge we just hear them as voices um what what are your thoughts on that on the sort of framing device and on this character of verge and the role that he plays i suppose in this film um so for me there are kind of moments throughout where verge is kind of operating as the voice in von trier's head if that makes sense yeah yeah totally in some ways i always think of him as as our voice too like uh, there's a few things that verge says where i'm like yeah i i agree with you there like <laughs> yeah i i think that you know von trier suffers from depression and i think that um uh, a lot of people with depression i'm not speaking for everybody here but um some people with depression have a horrible voice in their head that's criticizing them all mm -hmm. the time and kind of saying the worst things about them um and kind of one of the interesting things about verge is that he's played by bruno gans who obviously played hitler in downfall so you've got that kind of nazi yeah. connection but um there's there's one bit where he says that Jack is a, a fucking neurotic riddled with obsessive compulsions and a pathetic dream of something greater. That sounds to me like a, a voice in Lars von Trier's head talking to him. That's him yeah. talking to himself about himself. Um yeah 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 and that is you know and again that's i'm sure that's absolutely the case it it also feels to me like it's um it's his own critics i think as well there are moments when he says stuff and and verge is like oh please am i supposed to be am i supposed to be uh impressed by that am i supposed to be shocked or yeah. offended by that you know there is a lot of that kind of the classic lars backlash that you see everyone have when a new lars film comes out as well there are always that group of people that go oh for fuck's sake Lars you know and then and he is literally voicing that throughout the film as well isn't and, he and, yeah and that's kind of interesting in terms of my reading of it I think you're absolutely right and I there's a there's a chance that Lars is putting this stuff out there to take control of people's hatred of him like he's self-aware he knows that if he's going to put 
child death in a film in the way he does here or you know other elements that people are going to get angry at him and reject him but he's yeah. taking control of that because he's mm-hmm. almost misdirecting people so they hate him for that reason and not for other reasons um i really do feel like he's he's full of self-loathing um and i don't say that as a criticism i just think it's a kind of natural consequence of being in touch with your shadow side which is what well, almost all of his art's about yeah no i, I 100% agree with you i'm sure he is I'm, I bet he's his he's his ultimate critic, you know. I, I, exactly. I'm, I'm absolutely exactly. sure of that. You can see that in his. There's a, I don't know, not to kind of project my own thoughts on him as a person. I don't know him obviously, but there it feels like there is a, a fragility to him, um, even when you see him interviewed or in the public eye as much as he is this kind of big personality and provocateur and whatever else. There is also this quite. I don't know, this quite timid person at the centre of it. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah 100%. And in other instances, I'd also be worried about projection as well. Yes, um, yeah, yeah. You know, it's really hard to analyse someone from afar and it's kind of a, totally. a bit of a dangerous game. Um, but I do... And there are ways in which I do feel connected to, to Lars von Trier. There uh-huh. are <laughs> significant ways where... Uh, you know i don't i don't think that i'm a troll in the same way that he is and <laughs> and stuff like that and just to be clear um a little more flesh my film um when i was shopping it around initially some distributors basically warned me that people were going to think that Stan Lee was me, like that those were my views. Right, right, right. Because um, in the film, we should say you you play him, right? He is, is, he's, he's essentially off camera as a voice, but it's your voice, isn't it? Exactly. Um, yeah. And yeah, there's just two little things I'd like to explain there. One is that originally I was going to use an actor for that role, um, but the two kind of leads of the film elf and hazel um basically i'd done a commentary during production um yeah i'd edited the first 20 minutes and i'd done a commentary literally to show everyone what we were doing yeah. so that they could kind of get their head around it um and both elf and hazel basically said that they wanted me to do the commentary yeah um based on that first 20 minutes so that's kind of how i ended up doing it and yeah, I, I really want to make it clear that the character I play, Stanley, but the character that I identify the most with is Isabella. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, yeah. I, I, I won't go any more into it than that. But um, yeah, I, it, projecting is kind of a dangerous game. But I think especially with the house that Jack built, it's not even projecting like it's literally he goes through it's so on the nose in places it's like he's just it's and it's framed as a confession we talk about the framing but he literally says at the start that this is his confession yeah Um, yeah so exactly so yeah i i i I think we're kind of okay in kind of breaking this down and and reading what we want into that's right and i think we've talked a lot about lars as a person and i think we have to i think it's you know ultimately it feels to me like all of his films are about him and particularly these two films we're talking about right you know like i said antichrist feels to me like he's kind of ripping his own heart out and showing it to all of us really and and Mm. and maybe the house that jack built is doing something very similar or he's kind of in a slightly more maybe academic way kind of talking us through his process or his life or his career you know and i think it is i think it's valid isn't it i think you do have to kind of think a bit about the man to kind of appreciate the films in these instances a hundred percent there's a line in um leave her to heaven uh which is one of my favorite movies it's the gene turney picture from 1945 um which is technically a horror film so it's okay to discuss it on this podcast Um, (laughs) yes basically i mean very technically a horror film but it has 
one of it has a scene in it that is like a Lars von Trier scene it's so fucking disturbing but anyway um <laughs> one of the characters is talking to an author about his book and how revealing it is about him and he says but it's not about me and she replies that it is because every book's a confession mm-hmm. and Every Lars von Trier film is a confession. I think Antichrist and House that Jack built more than most. Yeah. But all auteur movies are about the auteur. Um, With contributions from all the collaborators kind of mudging those waters a little bit. But with von Trier, he is in such complete control of his films at every level. They can't not be about him. Like... Yeah, we are seeing him laid out in in really raw ways, and I think that's why I think that's why the criticism is thrown at his films that they are self indulgent, right? And and particularly <laughs> some of those longer ones, Nymphomaniac, which is four hours if you watch both parts <laughs> back to back, and the house that Jack built is it's a difficult thing. And and, it, and I, I myself have said this, I said this about the ha- the house that Jack built, that I do find it sometimes a bit too self-indulgent to the point where it loses me. Uh, in a similar way, and I know you're a huge fan, Sam, of Quentin Tarantino, but in a similar way, yeah. I find this with some of his later films as well, where sometimes I feel like you're, you're making a film more about yourself than you're making a film for me here. And that's fine. It's just that that's not always my cup of tea, I think. Yeah, Um, and like Tarantino is such a great comparison because, um, yeah, like Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, like how many shots of feet do we actually need? Like (laughs) it's almost like he's he's trolling us with that stuff. Exactly. And I love... I, I love Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. Like, for me, the more self-indulgent, the better. Yeah, like, yeah. I, I like these people because I see them as artists and... Um, totally. And actually, I've got to say, I mean, this is the thing, this is where I contradict myself because I love <laughs> Twin Peaks The Return, which is essentially an 18-hour... Yeah. Uh, self-indulgent you know artist looking at himself it feels to me so there you go so I guess it just depends on the artist and it depends on the art doesn't it but yeah yeah, it's all really interesting so let me let me kind of ask you I want to kind of go through the structure of the film briefly and and see kind of and just ask you your thoughts and if you've got anything you want to add to any of these specific scenes or if you've got any specific moments I suppose you want to talk about yeah what about chapter one then? So, as I said, this kind of the film sets it sets itself up in his life in five incidents, right? The first one is this quite short scene, relatively, which is where he uh, Jack picks up this woman who's broken down, played by Uma Thurman, and there is this entire scene where she's kind of she's sort of nagging him and bothering him, and this is another thing I have a bit of a problem with with this film where. You know, we've talked about the misogyny uh, accusations towards his other films, and I kind of have always defended Lars in that regard, but I find it difficult to defend him in this film because I feel like there are no female characters of any substance whatsoever here, and the ones that do appear are just victims or just like nagging stereotypes uh, like Uma mm. Thurman's character for example but what do you think of of this kind of sequence and this sort of first chapter of the film so yeah there's kind of a I don't think this is gonna help your feeling about the film actually <laughs> yeah. um, because now, I, I tried to actually look for this interview before we recorded this podcast because I've read it a long time ago and I wanted to make sure that it actually exists, but I couldn't find it online. Um, so take this with a pinch of salt. But um, I did read an interview with Lars um, and the interviewer called Uma's character annoying and Von Trier thought or pretended to think he was talking about Thurman herself, checking which he meant before saying that Thurman is also annoying, hence his confusion, right? Um, Again, allegedly, I can't find the actual interview, but uh, it did stick in my memory. Um, So, yeah, there's kind of already that crossover between fantasy and reality. Um, And in this first chapter, he does delve into the stuff with his mum again, Um, now, in, in the first chapter, Von Trier uses Glenn Gould to represent art and calls him one of the greatest piano players of all time. 
And Gould's an interesting choice. Like he could have gone for Beethoven or Schuber or whoever. Mm-hmm. But Gould was active when von Trier was born. And von Trier's real father was a pianist and his mother tried to make him play piano when he was younger. And we hear the piano playing in the background um, when Jack talks about the plans his mother had for him. About, you know, Jack's the plans Jack's mother had for him. Yeah. Um, And Jack became a different kind of artist than the one his mother intended. There is some dark stuff around women in there. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. You know, there's... And again, I'm very similar to you in that I've gone to to bat for for Lars in the past about the misogyny. Um, But I think that there's a chance that he's pushing our buttons um, with this stuff. Oh, you think I'm a misogynist? Well, have a look at this type thing. Yes, yes, Um, yes. You know, and I'm not sure how I feel about that on a moral level. Um, but in the same token, I'm not really a, a moral outrage person. I think, but the th- yeah, and I agree with you. You know, the, if if none of the actual actors had a hard time on this film, that's fine. You know, he can portray whatever types of characters he wants to portray. Yeah, it's just that it's for me, just on a very primary, fundamental level, it makes the film a bit of a dull watch for me because there are no characters that I feel I can enjoy. Um, that's the problem. I haven't got that kind of Charlotte Gainsbourg character or that Nicole Kidman character or that Willem Dafoe. I don't know. I don't I don't have anyone that I can really root for or enjoy, you know, in this film. That, and that's a problem for me, at least. I 100% see where you're coming from. I root for Von Trier. Right? <laughs> yeah, fair. Yeah. So so for me, I see this film as him working a load of shit out of his system um, and I'm hoping that he feels better for it. Uh, uh, you know, certainly I'm glad that it played Can because it's kind of, in a weird way, like that's the only place it could have premiered, um, you know, for reasons that maybe we'll have time to go into. But um, I just want to kind of go back to that misogyny point because sure. it, it had the opposite effect on me in a way in that this film contains a scene that has made me more uncomfortable than almost any other scene in a Von Trier movie, mm-hmm. um, partly because it, it's so extended um like often the horrors of von trier are kind of they kind of come and they go and sometimes there's catharsis you know like dogville has catharsis yeah yeah um but with this one um yeah the fourth chapter oh yeah that's that's where it to be honest that is where it lost me that is where it lost me yeah i struggled (laughs) i have i have really kind of conflicting feelings about this like i i do and again maybe i'm projecting empathy and and goodness onto this horrible sequence yeah yeah let me just i'll just explain it for context so the fourth the fourth chapter the fourth chapter is um is 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 the first time we're really given he's he basically introduces the fact that he was in a relationship with this woman right and it's this woman who let's be honest is portrayed as basically an airhead um she is this kind of like blonde very thinly drawn character who he calls simple he actually just calls her simple um and it is this kind of horrible kind of like you say prolonged scene of basically abuse while he mocks her and abuses her and humiliates her and he gets her to scream for help and then no one comes to help her and blah 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 and it goes on and on and there's a, she even runs and finds a policeman and then he doesn't help her and and then he he mutilates her he cuts off her breasts and it's it's very long and <sighs> that's the scene that really kind of yeah really kind of lost me because also i wasn't quite sure how it was what it was doing what it was supposed to be doing it almost felt like at times it was being played for laughs and that kind of made me feel a bit sick and gross i don't know what what sorry you carry on anyway sam what were your thoughts no no that's uh, just an amazing distillation of what it is (laughs) i feel like so there's different ways to read this like if I if you, anyone listening to this has ever encountered a narcissist, 
or a psychopath, like not a narcissist as in someone who looks at themselves in the mirror, but someone with narcissistic personality disorder. This kind of sequence kind of replicates, not just replicates the pattern of behaviour. So they're nice to you at the start, they're very kind, they kind of love bomb you, and then they kind of get crueler and crueler um, as the relationship kind of develops. Um, there's also a lot mm. of gaslighting and, and cognitive dissonance. Mm -hmm. And I almost feel like we're being gaslit in this scene. Like, yeah. Because there is a way of reading it um, where it is about the cruelty and the objectification of the film industry, right? Because mm -hmm. And about how people don't listen to women in the face of overwhelming evidence. Like the scene you talk about where she comes down the stairs and she talks to the police officer. Um, he asks her if she's drunk. And yeah. she's she's literally, you know, saying there's a serial killer up there. He's just told me he's killed 60 people. Um, and the police officer is kind of very dismissive. Then the ante gets upped when he comes down and shouts out loud that he's a serial killer. Yeah, right? yeah. Um, and the police officer basically says, come on, go back inside. You're both drunk. Um, and and so on, on that level, it feels like it's critiquing that. Mm -hmm. But yeah. then there's a couple of really disturbing speeches. Like um, there's Jack's speech about being pissed that it's always the man's fault. Um, he says, no matter where you go, it's like you're some sort of wandering guilty person without even harm to single kitten. I actually get sad when I think about it. Yeah. He, he says when he's sitting in front of a woman, he's just been objectifying and torturing. Um, yeah. And I don't know if he's talking about his own complicity in the industry. Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, he, he says, if one is so unfortunate as to have been born male, then you're also born guilty. Think of the injustice in that. Women are always the victims, right? And <laughs> yeah. men are always the criminals, right? Yeah. So a very misogynistic statement, um, unless you have been accused of something that you didn't do, right? Yeah, yeah. But then he also says this just before he cuts off Jacqueline's right breast, mm. um, which is obviously disturbing and sickening and it's one of the most kind of graphic moments in the film yeah yeah it is. for what it's worth and again i think that maybe i'm going too deep in in my analysis here but um the word amazon uh comes from a combination of a meaning without and maxis meaning breast because Amazonian women would have their right breast removed to make them better archers, um, right. to kind of make them better warriors. Mm -hmm. And the left breast was kept to feed babies, um, so to mother. Uh -huh. And Von Trier will be aware of this. Like, he is a student of mythology, and mythological references pop up throughout his films and within this film. So there is a chance that's a deliberate reference um mm -hmm. but i may i may be reading too much into it there but um no i mean it, it could all be i mean like like we keep saying it feels more like this is some sort of academic exercise right more than yes. any of his other films so it could well be in there definitely yeah and and there is that element of um trauma um like the film after this kind of sequence, the film goes on to suggest that kind of great art comes from trauma. And I do think that the best artists have come through trauma because it can give you kind of this intense level of empathy that you need to make great art. But, you know, he, he has, Von Trier as a director, has put women through torment, like both in terms yeah. of his characters, but, but also the the actors themselves like like i say they were consenting adults it was pretend um but any actor will tell you that performing some of the kinds of scenes that lars put his actors through they can be disturbing right yeah and and so like I, i've got my own example of this i won't go into it too much because of spoilers but there's a scene in a little more flesh that elf came up with um, they actually cast her real life partner for so she'd feel as safe and as comfortable as possible 
um, but it still felt really disturbing mm-hmm. as we shot it, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. And so I know I'm not a misogynist, um, and as I outlined before, I don't think that Von Trier is either. But to present difficult topics is, to a certain extent, to be complicit in them if you have empathy. And I do think he has empathy. So it's a really, really complex scene for me. Yeah. And I think that it's designed that way and it is meant to make us feel uncomfortable. But I don't think it's as simple as Lars von Trier hates women, so he's tortured this woman, he's he's been cruel to her, and it's just for our entertainment. I do think there are things being said here, but... Yeah, I I couldn't say for sure. Um, yeah, what those things are. I'm sure you're right. I am. I'm absolutely sure you're right because we know we've seen twenty, thirty years of his films now to know that. Yeah, you know, and I th- and it, but it's just it's still it's a frustrating watch for me because I'm like, come on, Lars, come on, <laughs> you're better, you're better than this, come on. <laughs> but yeah, it's it's a really interesting thing. Um, I, I, but I, I guess the very last point on this I'll make is that yeah. If this is indeed a video essay about Lars von Trier's career and, yeah. you know, how he uses filmmaking to process you know, lots of different shit, you cannot talk about Lars von Trier's career without the subject of misogyny coming up. You're, um, you're so right. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so so he had to approach it. And I guess he's done it in a very complex way. Um well, it's yeah. it's yes, it's like Jack is this personification of everything that is Lars, right? Or everything that yeah. is perceived to be Lars, this uh, psychopath, this uh, obsessive personality, this compulsive personality, this, uh, th- you know, this person that ponders and that talks about this and this and this, but also somebody who hates women and somebody... And it is, in a way, it's like all of the all of the comments and observations and criticisms thrown at at Lars over the last 30 years, I suppose, in many ways. Yeah, this is it. And, uh, you know, I, I, I do think we're probably coming close to running out of time here. So <laughs> yes, I'm, I'm yeah. going to I'm going to skip some some chapters just to round off the kind of the can angle. Um, sure, because sure, sure. Th- it isn't a reading I've seen elsewhere. And I do think that it's a big part of this whole process that he's going through with this film. Um, So by the time we get to the fifth chapter, we have had an overwhelming amount of of metaphors um, about his filmmaking. Like at one point, he he talks about changing his dead victim's facial expressions and positions (laughs) to create a little scene, to create a completely credible human being, which is obviously the work of a director yeah. um, and we've had veiled references to Antichrist and, and Melancholia and, and all this other stuff but in parallel to that we've also had some stuff about him not being caught right mm-hmm. um, but in the fifth chapter he does get caught and what trips him up he's trying to recreate an atrocity committed by German soldiers so yeah. just as Von Trier's kind of Nazi comments led to him being caught out in Cannes, here Jack is caught while he's kind of trying to recreate this war crime, right? Mm-hmm. And when he gets caught, he says something really interesting to a random guy who we haven't actually met before. Um, but it's clear that, you know, these characters have a history. And um, yeah, Jack says... I'm kind of glad you're the one who caught me. Perhaps you don't know this, but I think of you as my best friend. Now, that might not be a big deal to you, but you've meant a great deal to me. Somebody Mm -hmm. had to free me and stop me from stealing things that don't belong to me. And that someone turned out to be you, right? Mm -hmm. I honestly think he's talking about Can there. Like, I think... Can is his best friend. It, 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 Can has been in his life since 1984, since his first movie. Um, and I think he's talking about his kind of cultural appropriation, uh, for want of a better word, in that press conference. Um, yeah, I, I just, yeah. I, I really think that... Because it, it's, it's weird that he's saying somebody had to free me and stop me from stealing things that don't belong to me and that someone turned out to be you because there is no theft in this film yeah it's not 
one of his primary motivations is it yeah um, yeah yeah you're you're yeah that's so true so yeah there's a, a very kind of weird connection and so he gets away from that kind of trap or or at least it seems like he does and he goes back to these victims and he's basically making a movie in this this bit he's he's lining up a shot on a tripod yes um, yes and we see him adjusting the focus on the gun <laughs> just as a cinematographer would and yeah von trier actually operated the camera on many of his films and he says i can't focus it's too close um, which is obviously, you know, you can read that in different ways. Um, yeah, and then Verge appears and it's clear that he didn't actually get away, um, that he was caught. And even though he's making another film, he still has the consequences of his actions from earlier mm-hmm. um, that, like I say, I do feel links to Can. Yeah, um, that's so yeah, interesting. And, and now he's on his way to hell. So, yeah, we'll get to that in a moment. I know, <laughs> I love that. And then, can I just say as well, on a very kind of like, on a on a, on a more sort of prime, primal level, that mm. scene, I think is really effective scene, actually, when he's lining up all of the men and is going to shoot them because there is that element of sort of suspense where uh, both times I've watched it now, I just, I want it to happen i want him to shoot them <laughs> because the, the way that it is dragged out and dragged right. out and dragged out you know you get to that point in some movies where you almost just you want the worst thing to happen so that it can get it over with you know and there is a there is an excruciating amount of build-up and tension in you know towards that scene isn't there um which i actually find really effective in that way you know it's the kind of crazy thing yeah like it, it's it's a horror scene. Like, it, is, it is. It is. It's it's like something out of Saw, and even like the hood is kind of weirdly Saw. Yes. Um, yeah. I'm, I'm definitely not saying that Von Trier is is influenced by Saw, <laughs> but who knows? Because you know, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it, it's it's he is demonstrating. I, I like take this out of the context of my analysis of the movie itself, but yeah. just as a personal observation, like he could be. An incredible horror director if he wanted to yes um, yes yes you know i agree it, with he's you. got everything that sequence it really it really does actually yeah i agree with you um so let's just finish by talking about the final act when he when he descends into hell uh i actually i've heard from a lot of people when i tweeted about house that jack pill a lot of people have said didn't like the film but loved that ending or a lot of people said it really won me over with that incredible ending um here's the thing here's the thing to those people right? yeah and i yeah. you know you've got a lovely audience i'm i'm not i'm certainly not dissing anyone that, that tweeted <laughs> that right yeah but you earned that ending my friend like <laughs> yeah. anyone that loved that ending there's a reason it's a massive release yeah like you've been through all of this ugliness and then you get this kind of transcendent moment. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, it's like, like a martyr's I, I, moment. <laughs> and and do you know what the the second time I watched it, or you know, the time I watched it after uh, speaking with Mary, and my own kind of observation about the significance of the piano player. Yeah. Um, I found the moment when Jack looks at his house of bodies or his work of bodies or his body of work, depending on, you know, however you want to read it. (laughs) Um, But when the piano music plays in that moment, I found it incredibly moving. (laughs) Yeah. I know that's a strange thing to say about this film, but it did make me cry. And I wasn't crying for Jack. I was crying for Lars von Trier. Uh Uh-huh. And the kind of pain and trauma that he just carries with him today as fresh as when he first heard what mary's going to go into later it it still pains him and he's made this work as an artist but he'll never silence that that kind of piano playing um so yeah the work is kind of a, a gateway to hell and when they go down into hell, obviously it, it mixes techniques. We've got the the beautiful painterly stuff from Antichrist and, and Melancholia with the slow motion, and there's an incredibly Dogma ninety five sequence yes. in there too, isn't there? When they're like, sort of going, they're going through the cave, yeah, exactly. Like it's it's I I feel like 
he must have shot it on one of the digital cameras that they used for for Dogma ninety five because it's so the same. Um, and perhaps saddest of all uh, for us, Lars Heads, uh, it kind of ends with him trying to escape hell before falling into the deepest part. Mm-hmm. And then um, we kind of cut to the negative image, which um, he, he talked about the the negative image bringing out the darkness that's hidden in the light earlier on in the film. And I kind of think that's a symbol of depression. Um, yeah. Yeah. And certainly in that animated sequence where he's talking about going from lamp to lamp, that is very much him talking about how creativity helps him with his depression, um, I, I think. And so to have that image pop up is sad to me. Um, yeah. And then when it cuts to hit the road, Jack, and don't you come back, mm-hmm. I, I do feel like this is going to be Von Trier's last feature film. Um, yeah. I, I, I I hope it isn't, but I think we could be in kind of a David Lynch situation where Inland Empire also felt like a goodbye movie to me. And I actually, I said this to Lynch yeah. and uh, he obviously didn't answer me directly. He gave me an oblique answer, as is his want. Yes. Um, <laughs> what do you think it's about, Sam? <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> oh, that's a... Gr- oh, y- your Lynch impression is as good as mine. But, <laughs> but yeah, he... Um, he he basically didn't answer, but it's kind of borne out because he hasn't made a feature film since. I mean, yeah. you can talk about Twin Peaks, The Return being a film if you want, but <laughs> of me, course. it's telly. Yeah, um, yeah. But yeah, um, I and, and you know, since then, um, Von Trier has announced that he's going to be involved in another series of The Kingdom, much like Lynch did more Twin Peaks. Mm-hmm. And those two projects are kind of interesting in terms of crossovers and stuff but anyway yeah. enough analysis everyone listening to this must be so exhausted oh i love um, it it's been it's been genuinely fascinating sam and, and honestly it's like i'm jealous that i wish i had that kind of emotional response actually that you do i really do actually wish i had that because um i do i do kind of love lars and i really hope this isn't his last film i hope i can see more from yeah. him actually i was reading some letterboxed reviews and some of them are genuinely kind of make really kind of made me feel sad because there are i think a lot of people that were genuinely a bit worried about lars off mm. the back of this film um i read these random letterbox reviews from people going this was an incredible film but i'm genuinely worried about lars can somebody check on him is he okay this feels very much like a kind of goodbye note do you know what i mean and i think pe- you yep. know there is something like that there is something dark there's something there's a darkness in lars von trier which we've talked about over and over again for the last two hours and like you said the way that this film ends there is something quite sad and worrying and scary about that isn't there, I think? there there's it it's sad but it's also in a strange way triumphant uh-huh because yeah. he he's taken control again you know he's taken control of his own narrative and he has produced this final statement if that's what it is that lays it all out you know yeah. for for people to either take to their heart or reject yeah. Um and I think the fact that it played at Cannes, it was his return to Cannes, this specific film, I think that that's an element of triumph as well. Um yeah. Yeah. so, you know, god uh, if only if uh, if I could be an artist as in control of my art as Von Trier is and I could end my career with a final statement film, you know, that's kind of a dream. <laughs> yeah. And you know, it is worrying. He does suffer from depression and it's all laid out in this film. But, you know, he's told his story and you can't help but respect that. Yeah. So there you go. Um, we're going to wrap things up shortly, but let's just head to this week's second Wild About Horror segment because Mary has got more to say. Um, this is one of her personal favourite films, I believe. So I'm really excited to hear what Freudian cinephile Mary Wilde thinks of the house that Jack built. Hello, Evolution of Horror listeners. This is Mary Wilde, back with you to share ideas relating to Lars von Trier's The House That Jack Built. As a lot of you know, he's a director with a penchant for film trilogies, a knack for developing thorny subjects across cinematic triptychs. 
Not heard this interpretation elsewhere, but I believe that The House That Jack Built is the third and final installment in Lars's USA Land of Opportunities trilogy, which started with Dogville and Manderley. Taken together, these titles deal with the precariousness of group dynamics, the discontents of civilization, and all manner of human brutality. Lars always said he wanted to conclude the trilogy with a film about a serial killer in Washington, D.C. As it happens, The House That Jack Built chronicles a series of murders committed by a psychopath in Washington State over a period of 12 years. Lars von Trier has always been fascinated by American culture and society, despite never even having traveled to the United States due to a severe phobia of flying. The character of Grace Mulligan in Dogville and Manderley is a representation of the earnest American psyche, magnanimous, idealistic, hardworking, and virtuous. Dogville and Manderley open with a God's eye view of a Brechtian soundstage, with buildings marked only by chalk lines on the floor. The absence of walls makes surveillance total, as aspects of private life are supervised, and so too is Grace's character revealed over time. Particularly in Manderley, she takes on the position that Tom Edison occupied in Dogville, that of a preacher on a high horse who aims to save others through noble activism, which Lars exposes as cringeworthy self-indulgence. The house that Jack built switches gears radically from community-oriented do-gooder Grace to bloodthirsty Jack. By pitting these diametrically opposed individuals against each other in the trilogy, Lars creates a state of ambivalence out of which arises a powerful critique of America's culture of violence, narcissism, and political decline. In his magnum opus, Civilization and Its Discontents, Sigmund Freud wrote, Men are not gentle creatures who want to be loved. Men are aggressive. As a result, their neighbor for them is not only a potential helper or sexual object, but also someone whose work may be exploited without compensation, to use sexually without consent, whose possessions may be seized, someone to humiliate, to harm, to torture, and to kill. This passage from Freud could have been the tagline of Dogville, Manderley, and the house that Jack built. The violence we see in all three films is a statement about a subject's relationship with their quintessentially American society. The shining city on a hill in U.S. politics refers to America as a land of opportunity and a beacon of hope for the world, a celebration of market freedom and military power, a call for Americans to renew their optimism and believe in themselves. The violence in Lars's three films is the language of the unheard, indicating that the promised land didn't fulfill its end of the bargain. Validating Freud's doubts about the effect of civilization, the films show tensions between the quest for instinctual freedom and society's demand for conformity and repression. The House That Jack Built is an exhibition of traumatic relationships emerging from civilization. The internalized authority of cultural norms are binding. To go against them is to risk expulsion from the group. Primal pleasure has been exchanged for the security and stability that living in a civilized society offers. Strangulation is an interesting killing method in the house that Jack built. It extinguishes eros, which in ancient Greek literally means the breath of life. Jack recalls, as a child, hearing the synchronized breath of village men cutting meadows with their sights, everyone working in unison, exhaling when they mowed, inhaling when they pulled the sight back. Those village men form an alliance together, living in their own sacred rhythm. This is something Jack aspired to but could never quite reach, that elusive sense of group membership represented as an oasis in the Elysian fields. Jack gazes longingly upon it, but remains quite separate from it. Alas, he's on a journey straight to hell. It is therefore fascinating that Jack wants to perfect the technique of choking his victims to death, doing so just correctly and for long enough, stifling the traumatic dimension of the breath, erasing its significance that he's been cast out, excommunicated from the society that would not have him. The psychopath takes pleasure in asphyxiating society because the paradox is too overwhelming. The irony of civilization having been created to eliminate loneliness, but now has become a source of so much unhappiness. In one gruesome scene, Jack brings a woman and her two sons to a forest clearing for a hunting lesson, gives them red baseball caps to wear, then hunts and kills them all. 
The caps remind me of Donald Trump's Make America Great Again merch. There is a reference in the script to culling and ethnic cleansing. To me, this is a legitimate critique of the far-right racist elements of modern American political discourse. But because the presentation of it was so excessive, the takeaway message of the scene seems to have been that Lars von Trier is a pervert who enjoys watching kiddos get gunned down. Uh, okay. <laughs> Actually, in a recent interview, Lars shared his belief that the golden age of democracy is over. His cinema is a really useful resource for assessing the current era of bombastic political posturing. In another scene that got film critics knickers in a twist, Jack's dysfunctional relationship with Jacqueline is depicted. He disparagingly refers to his girlfriend as simple, as he believes her to be stupid. But her name being a feminine counterpart to his own is vital. Here we are privy to what he does to himself. I regard it as a unique representation of depraved self-harm. Jacqueline becomes frightened when Jack confesses to having killed 60 people and approaches a policeman on the street who dismisses her as a drunk and sends her back inside. Locked without escape in the apartment, Jack torments her that no matter how loudly she screams for help, no one will come to her rescue because no one cares. Nobody wants to help. Jack is talking to himself. What Lars says here is that the disease of America and the world, that is to say social apathy and having no compassion for the well-being of our neighbors, is a more heinous act of terror than Jack being a serial killer. The house that Jack built uses Dante's Inferno as a metatext and is structured as a series of flashback vignettes relayed by Jack to the Roman poet Virgil, who leads the serial killer through the nine circles of hell. Jack tries to justify his crimes. He sees murder as a grand artistic gesture. The format here reminds me of Nymphomaniac, in which the character of Joe tells Seligman her life story in a free associative style, remarking on various topics and anecdotes without a filter. Stream of consciousness speech is also something that got Lars von Trier in hot water at a Cannes Film Festival press conference in 2011 when he got drawn into an ill-advised joke about Hitler, a joke that was made entirely at his own expense, a joke that got him thrown out of the festival after being declared persona non grata, an unwelcome person. This embarrassing incident places Lars in the discursive position of his beloved Marquis de Sade's Justine. Tormented, put on trial, dragged through the dirt, desperately trying to relay a complex psychosexual history, hoping against hope that we'll understand. Lars once said, I cannot be with a person for three hours without saying at least ten things that would kill me. Provocation, hitting a nerve, sometimes going too far, Collecting a freezer full of pearl-clutching haters who churn out oven-ready piping hot takes? This is the house that Lars built, the one he lives in. And honestly, more power to him. I'd live there with him anytime. Catch you on the next episode. A huge thank you once again to the brilliant Mary Wilde. Now, don't forget, if you want to hear more from Mary, if you want to hear more of her takes on genre films, you can listen to her podcast. That's the Projections podcast. You can find that wherever you get your podcasts. And if you want information about any of Mary's upcoming courses, she's always got loads of really interesting stuff going on, then make sure you follow her on Twitter. You can find her there at Psychstar. Okay, Sam, uh, we're going to wrap things up, um, but my last question for you, I've got to ask you, putting you on the spot a little bit here, we've been talking about all things Lars von Trier. I want mm. to hear, what are your top three Lars films? What do you think? I think probably Breaking the Waves is my absolute favourite. I just think that it's it's like magic, that film. Like, uh -huh. it's got everything. It's got absolutely everything. Um, and then second would probably be Dancer in the Dark. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm also a massive Fassbinder fan. And yeah, Dancer in the Dark feels very, very Fassbinder. Actually, that's a recommendation. If anyone listening to this hasn't really delved into Raina Verna Fassbinder, yes. I think you'll find a lot there that, that yeah crosses over with Von Trier. Um, and... Yeah, final choice. Hmm. I think 
as tempted as I am to throw House That Jack built in there, just um, <laughs> you know, to yeah. try and give it some sort of uh, legacy, <laughs> I, I do actually. Dogville, uh, I think that was actually my first Von Trier movie, um, right. Dogville, which is partly why I say it's a good entry point. But um, yeah, I had just literally, obviously never seen anything like it before because no one had. And um, it's just a masterpiece. And I love re- revenge narratives and, and all that kind of thing. So yeah, that's yeah. my top three. Mike, yeah. please tell me your top three. It's so similar to yours, to be honest. I think for me, number one is Melancholia. It just yeah. destroys destroyed me that film and then it would be dogville for the same reasons as what you just said and and then dancer in the dark as well so Mm. there you go we've both named three films that we haven't discussed this week but like there are (laughs) honestly so many films of his worth watching aren't there that's the thing it's like i'm excited for people that haven't seen all of these gems that can that can go and give them a watch well look if you ever do a revenge series um please bring me back for dogville (laughs) <laughs> absolutely absolutely um amazing well sam thank you so much for this and thank you so much for joining me um just tell us where people can find can find you and find more of your work out there online and okay so um a little more flash is uh, available on troma now um and frankenstein's creature is also available as a digital download on the hex media website um sold out on dvd but you can still get the digital download um and that comes with commentaries as well um there's one with me and dan and there's commentary from james swanton the star and i would recommend listening to james swanton's commentary above mine it is (laughs) fucking amazing james James is so goddamn eloquent isn't he 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 is he really is so um but yeah, please do check out a little more flesh. I hope I haven't put you all off it <laughs> um, in the discussion in, in this film. But um, yeah, it's kind of a, a weirdly personal film. So um, please do check it out. Love it. Sam, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you, Mike. And that's it for this week. Thank you so much for listening and a huge thank you to this week's brilliant guest, Sam Ashurst. So please do tell me what you guys think of this week's films, The House That Jack Built and Antichrist. They are divisive movies. They really split fans, especially horror fans, down the middle. I'd love to hear your thoughts on them. Please do get in touch. The email address is evolutionofhorror at gmail.com. You can also find us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Letterboxd. And if you want to discuss this week's films with fellow listeners, then join the discussion group. That's the Evolution of Horror discussion group, and that can be found on Facebook. If you want to support this podcast financially and be treated to weekly bonus content, then sign up to our Patreon. That's patreon.com slash evolution of horror if you sign up at a five dollar level you will get regular bonus episodes including mailbag episodes and new release reviews and a bunch of other stuff if you sign up at a ten dollar level you'll get new episodes every single week including access to our exclusive mini seasons such as our hitchcock retrospective our saw retrospective and our extreme cinema series loads of other stuff going on over there and if you want to become a sponsor just like dave middleton this week then you can sign up at a 20 dollars level for more information on all of this head over to patreon.com slash evolution of horror you can find this podcast on all major podcast platforms and if you want to support this podcast but you can't afford to do so financially we would be hugely grateful if you could just spare a few seconds to drop us a little rating and review on apple podcasts that really helps us get discovered by new listeners okay then next week we are moving on to a an absolute personal favorite of mine one of my all-time favorite films one that i've been looking forward to covering on this podcast for a very long time next week i'm going to be joined by brad hansen and we are going to be discussing one film and one film only jonathan glazer's under the skin from 2013 join us next week for all of this and more on the evolution of horror.